Thanks so much for having me today. I'm really excited to share some of my research findings. So today I'll be drawing on research from a variety of qualitative, quantitative, and clinical-based studies I've conducted over the years, both on my own and with various colleagues, including the project that Barb mentioned, um, but also some projects that precede that. So the bulk of the findings will be drawn from my collective work with members of the Migrant Worker Health Project. This project brings together practitioners like doctors and nurses with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, or OCAO, as well as IAVGO, a legal clinic that provides support to workers as they navigate the WSIB system, as well as researchers primarily from the International Migration Research Centre at Wilfrid Laurier University. Together, we've been carrying out various studies on migrant worker health for the past 15 years or so. In today's presentation, I'm also including some recent adapted material co-created with my long-standing colleague, Michelle Tu, who's an occupational health nurse at OCAO. And she's put together some updated stats and figures on migrant agricultural workers' clinical issues um, and also with respect to COVID. I think Michelle is on the call today, so if we have any questions for her, hopefully she can chime in as well. Okay, so here's just a brief overview of the topics I'll be covering today. First, just going over a little bit about migrant agricultural workers for those who may be unfamiliar, then discussing some of their main health risks and issues, their barriers to accessing healthcare and WSIB or workers' compensation here in Ontario, and then some strategies to improve access to care. And I'll end with a few notes uh, about the COVID context, which has really changed the dynamics for migrant workers. Okay, so I'm going to briefly start off with some basic points about the migrant worker population for those who may be unfamiliar. There are over 50,000 migrant agricultural workers who come to Canada each year, and they're really here to perform the difficult, demanding labor for low pay to support the agricultural industry and also ensure that we Canadians can have access to affordable and reliable local food. So there are now various streams of the temporary foreign worker program employing agricultural workers. I won't get into all the details, but this pie chart represents all of them. Uh, the longest standing of these and the most common is the seasonal agricultural worker program, which brings workers to Canada for up to a maximum of eight months each year from Mexico and Caribbean countries only. That employers are basically able to control uh, who they hire so they can choose the nationality and gender of their choice. Um, Jamaica was the first country to participate in this program in 1966, but over the years, employers have increasingly preferred hire to hire workers from other countries, particularly Mexico, in part because they don't speak English and they're viewed as more subservient. There are now workers coming through other streams of the Temporary Foreign Worker Program from countries as diverse as Thailand, the Philippines, and Guatemala, which you can see here. Employers also highly favor men, with women comprising just 3% of program spots, and really they're hired in more gender-specific roles, uh, such as flower picking. So there are a number of factors that entrench workers' vulnerability to health and human rights abuses in these programs. First, they have tied work permits named to a particular employer, which means that they do not have the right to circulate freely in the labor market, and generally they must stay with the employer to whom they are assigned, regardless of their treatment. Second, workers also have precarious immigration status. So in effect, they are permanently temporary. Although they're wanted for their labor each year, they generally have no right to stay or settle or reunite with their families in Canada with few exceptions. They're expected basically to return home at the end of each contract and are dependent on the callback of their employer to return, which puts them in a tremendous power imbalance where they feel they have little choice but to appease their employer's demands, even when these may risk their health and safety. In this context, the constant fear of dismissals, deportations, or exclusions from future employment opportunities without any formal appeals process when they are fired keeps workers from feeling empowered to exercise their rights or to voice their concerns. Now, further complicating the situation is a context of agricultural exceptionalism. Basically, agriculture is seen as a unique industry necessitating labor rights exemptions that would be standard in other industries. So just using the example of the province of Ontario, all agricultural workers here are excluded from the Labor Relations Act, so they don't have the right to bargain collectively as part of a union. And they're also excluded from several important aspects of the Employment Standards Act around 
things like hours of maximum work. Further, migrant workers are also entrenched in this program in a position of structural inequality globally. So their position of poverty in countries of the global south renders them materially dependent on these jobs in order to support their families. And as workers who are Black and people of colour, working in predominantly white rural communities, they face structural and interpersonal racism. These workers also lack a strong social support network in Canada, being largely excluded from educational, cultural, and social opportunities. Language differences further exacerbate these dimensions of exclusion, and little effort is made by the Canadian government to overcome these challenges to ensure their integration. And that's really precisely because these workers are not seen as members of the Canadian society, but rather as temporary guests, even though many of them spend the majority of their adult lives living and working here in Canada. Their work is deemed essential, but they as people are not. So in this context, our work over various projects has sought to identify some of the main health issues experienced by workers, which I'll expand on in this presentation. Just briefly here, uh, occupational hazards in agriculture are common. Really, ag agriculture is one of the most dangerous industries in Canada. Workers face numerous risks, such as repetitive bending and lifting, exposure to pesticides and extreme heat, all often without adequate hygiene. For example, many work in fields without ready access to bathrooms and sinks. But the broader context of their employment and life in Canada also generates compounded hazards to their health. For example, because they live on isolated farm properties, they often lack, lack safe transportation into town and must rely on poorly equipped bicycles to access the necessities of life. Every year, some workers are seriously injured or die riding along dark rural roads without lights or helmets, as was the case in this picture, where two Jamaican workers, William Ball and Desmond McNeil, were hit and killed in Ontario. Housing conditions are also extremely variable and they're often overcrowded. And you may have seen in the media recently, there have been new articles in Quebec about some of the really inhumane conditions some workers experience. Workers also often lack access to condoms and contraceptives and women face particular challenges to accessing reproductive health care, including prenatal care. Many women also, in, uh, sorry, many workers, both men and women, also endure mental health issues due to painful family separations and disempowerment. So this quote from a worker I interviewed really gets to the crux of the problem. He said, there are some bosses that are good, but there are other bosses that are totally horrible. The well-being of their workers doesn't interest them. I don't know why. I guess we are like disposable machines to them. They work us hard until we wear out, then they replace us with others. Essentially, workers are viewed as interchangeable, and there is no incentive to uphold their health when they can be easily replaced at the first sign of injury or illness. In a survey of 600 workers led by my colleague Jenna Hennebry, repetitive movements, working in fixed postures, and working in extreme heat were some of the predominant risks facing the vast majority of these workers, and as you can see, they endured many other health hazards as well. On top of these risks, migrant workers work tremendously long hours, sometimes up to 18 hours a day during the peak periods, sometimes seven days a week without sufficient breaks or rest periods. The majority of the workers we surveyed said that they had not received any occupational health and safety information or training and that they would work while sick in order to not lose paid hours. While nearly half stated that they would work while they're sick because they're afraid of their employer. As one worker expressed, you have to be there to do what the boss tells you. If you start to disobey him, you will no longer return. For that reason, one has to accept everything, although you know that it is not the correct thing or that they are committing injustices against you. You have to allow it. With respect to living conditions, many workers report living in overcrowded, overheated environments, many without air conditioning, fans, or adequate ventilation, which can contribute to stress and exhaustion, and of course, in the case of COVID, can contribute to spread as well. Some report living without sufficient cooking or food storage facilities, which can contribute to foodborne illness and inadequate nutrition. In practice, housing varies widely from overcrowded trailers and bunkhouses with dilapidated washrooms and kitchen facilities to homes that are pretty comfortable, equipped with satellite TV and other amenities. The problem is that the housing guidelines are minimal 
And the quality really varies across jurisdictions and really even with individual firms. Despite a high degree of control and restriction that workers experience while living on farm property, many workers who spend the majority of their adult lives in Canada form romantic and sexual relationships, often with other workers. In a study conducted with my colleagues at Brock University and Positive Living Niagara, we aim to uncover the sexual health needs and risks facing workers, and I'll just mention this very briefly. Um, We found that while the majority of workers are aware of the benefits of condoms, only 19% reported that they always use them. And the vast majority reported that they were unaware of where to get free condoms or other contraceptive options. Women facing pregnancy face unique challenges and are often unable to access prenatal care as they're afraid to disclose their pregnancies for fear of job loss. This was a, a really common concern among women workers. Um, As one worker explained, many women end up pregnant in the program and then miscarry due to the difficult work they must perform, especially with the chemicals and the heavy lifting and the cold temperatures. I had great fear performing various tasks in Canada while pregnant, but there was nothing I could do. I could not ask to change my circumstances or I'd risk my job. So again, we see that common thread of workers feeling that they really are unable to access rights, benefits and protections because of that fear of job loss. So Ontario's Norfolk region has among the highest concentrations of migrant workers in the country with close to 5,000. So this is a really great region to look for data and patterns. Uh, Most workers here lack access to primary health care services and seek attention at the ER when they need help. This chart summarizes the issues with which the workers presented over three years. Injury and trauma were the most common, likely due to the propensity for workplace accidents. These were followed by gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, respiratory, and skin issues, again, all reflective of the risks in agriculture. To complement this ER data, here are some additional statistics provided by OCAO, who's hosted occupational health clinics for workers over many years, based on the frequency of health conditions. So we see a similar pattern, with musculoskeletal being the most common, followed by dermal, eye, and GI. Okay, so now using the case study of Ontario where I've done my research, I will discuss issues regarding healthcare access. All migrant agricultural workers in the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program are eligible for OHIP or the provincial health coverage here. In our survey of nearly 600 workers, nearly 20% did not have access to their OHIP card when we surveyed them. So employers may fail to take workers to apply for cards or they may delay in doing so or in some cases, they even withheld the cards once they're received, so workers had to ask them for permission to use it. Most workers also have basic supplementary coverage for things like prescription medication, but their coverage packages varies by their country of origin. Now, while workers do have these legal access to healthcare, there are a number of barriers that prevent their access in practice. These generally fall into two categories, logistical barriers due to long hours of work in isolated rural locations, as well as structural barriers related to the power imbalance in the program. With respect to logistical barriers, migrants typically work long hours on farms, while health clinics in rural areas tend to offer limited daytime hours, which means workers must leave their work in order to access care. At this point, they also lack independent transportation, as I mentioned earlier. So we also have that, plus some workers are experiencing delays to receive their cards, and many workers don't speak English or French, and there are a lack of interpreters. So for all of these combined reasons, workers are generally dependent on their employers to facilitate access to care or even just get permission to go. Um, and this is where the structural problems arise. Due to their position of vulnerability, they're often reluctant to report their concerns to their employers, and therefore they end up going without care. If they do request time off to seek care, Generally, employers will ask why, or they will even attend appointments with them or send a supervisor to do so, but workers don't feel comfortable disclosing their health concerns in this context. I mean, this is understandable. I don't think any of us wants to disclose our health issues or have our employer accompany us to see a healthcare provider. But in this case, their fear is compounded because they're concerned that their employer may develop a negative impression of them, and this could cost them their future employment. Generally, workers also don't receive information about the healthcare system. Many don't even know how to access emergency services such as 911 or telehealth. They also lack long term transnational healthcare. So, for chronic or permanent conditions, they're unable to access care 
in many cases after they return home from Canada. So in practice, all of these barriers lead to a major underutilization of the healthcare system for migrant workers. Um, if we return to the Norfolk Hospital data, for example, we can see that just 4% of migrant workers access ER services on average per year, while 42% of non-migrant residents in that same region access these services in the same time period. And this is particularly glaring since migrant workers disproportionately rely on ER services in the absence of access to family doctors. Workers may be waiting until their problems are really quite severe in order to seek care and not benefiting from preventative care or early interventions. Now, healthcare providers face many challenges when providing care, and we've interviewed some of them over the years as well. Um, workers are often brought to the hospital or clinic by an employer or supervisor who acts as an informal translator, regardless of their language skills. Many doctors we interviewed appreciated the convenience of this service, but many workers feel really uncomfortable having their employers act as an interpreter. For example, as one migrant worker said, the supervisor slash translator divulges what happens. For example, if I go to the doctor to examine my genitals, the supervisor will divulge what, that this is happening to me, and I don't want the world to know what I have. Providers also face challenges when workers show up without OHIP cards and further challenges emerge when referring for tests or follow-up treatment in this context. As one physician explained, when we have to refer to other specialists, we'll say, you know, I have a migrant worker here who has a kidney stone or whatever the situation is. Well, do they have a health card? Is it valid? How am I going to get paid? It's understandable that a physician would not want to work and take the medical legal responsibility without having some kind of remuneration for the work as well. Now, with respect to workers' compensation, which is known as WSIB here in Ontario, migrant workers actually have expanded coverage beyond that of typical Canadian workers, which is great. So they are covered not only at their work site, but also in transportation between their home and their work because it's employer-provided property that they live on. So if they fall in the kitchen at home, they are covered. However, even with this expanded coverage, there are many problems with underreporting of injuries and illnesses to the board, which I'll briefly touch on. So in a previous study that Jenna Hanabri and I led on workers' compensation access, we surveyed 100 workers. The majority of these workers had not received any information about workers' compensation, and of those who had, the majority reported that they didn't understand the process. There was also no one clear, consistent source of this information. Of the injured workers we interviewed, only 31% had applied to the WSIB, and of those, only about half were satisfied with the amount they received, thinking that it covered their actual expenses. So many of the same barriers related to healthcare access also prohibit proper identification and treatment of work-related injury or disease, because workers are not able to access clinics or healthcare providers or are unable to understand the cause of their concerns. Healthcare providers, though, may also fail to claim for um, WSIB. They may not understand the cause of the problem as work-related. They may be unaware of workers' rights to compensation, or the worker or employer may ask the provider not to submit a claim. Then, when workers are repatriated before their claims are investigated or filed, this can create even more complex challenges. Such workers are then ineligible for returning and re-employment and retraining opportunities because they're no longer in Canada. And if their injuries persist and prevent their return in the future, they may be left without any income or way to support their families. If their claim wasn't originally filed in Canada, it's much harder to later get a claim recognized and compensated. An audit by one of the physicians on our team of patient files in the Norfolk ER data found that 28% of migrant worker patient visits were filed as WSIB. In his audit, though, 36% of cases were clearly work-related and up to 50% in total were possibly or clearly work-related. So that represents a significant underreporting of work-related issues to the WSAB, even at the ER, where they're presenting with more acute distress. In nearly 1,000 cases seen at the OCA clinics, again, the majority were assessed as either directly or indirectly work-related. And again, few WSAB claims. Now, when there is a clear workplace injury, such as a broken arm, it is more straightforward to file for WSIB. But when things get tricky is when there's a gray area like back pain or when workers or employers apply pressure not to file a claim. As one physician explains, 
If I can see an injury and there's a clear cause and effect, then I'll file. But usually I'll, I try to keep it out. And a lot of guys don't want to have, to have anything to do with WSIB because they don't want it on record. Again, that same concern of disappointing employers. Now, from injured workers' perspectives, uh, not knowing about the right to compensation or how to access services and fear of losing employment or inability to take time off work were all major deterrents to filing claims. So this worker's quote really sums up many of the challenges. Um, he says, I was in Canada working for four years before I ever got a health card. During that time, I was injured when a tractor ran over my foot. The worker who ran over me begged me not to tell the boss because he didn't want to get in trouble. And I was new here and I didn't know my rights. I just kept working through the injury. Now we have our health card, but we have to ask the boss for them. He doesn't just give them to us. The boss also told us if we go to the doctor with any complaint, to not to tell them it's work related, tell them we got hurt off the job. So workers can be fired and repatriated by their employers even while awaiting care or investigations into their injuries and illnesses. Once they're back home, it can be very difficult to receive care and investigations into their injuries. So it's important for providers to be aware of these implications and to offer as much care and investigation as possible before workers are repatriated. Um, again, a few quotes here, a, a doctor in Simcoe said, I don't think it's necessarily understood by myself or others who are caring for them that our decision may impact their ability to remain in the country and for how long as they're asked to, to fill out forms about their condition. And a couple of really insightful quotes here from WSIB managers and executive. Um, the first said, I think that an injured worker is in the eye of the employer is a liability to them in terms of, not getting, of work not getting done. There are a lot of situations where they get repatriated because the farmers want a replacement, their widgets. And a second talks about the challenges of getting care back uh, in the countries of origin, saying, if you go back to Mexico to get treatment, where do we run into the problem? Paying for the treatment, getting reports for the treatment, is the treatment falling under our guidelines? Doing something that we weren't going to cover, you know, wh what you're dealing with is a foreign country, you're dealing with a foreign doctor, et cetera. And of course, these challenges of, of not understanding the system across countries um, are quite understandable and predictable. So as mentioned previously, when the cause and effect is clear and the injury is severe, workers are more likely to receive compensation, but even then they and their families may suffer long-term consequences without adequate support. Like this worker who had his wrist crushed in a machine accident, after being deported back to Jamaica, he was cut off of compensation benefits because he was told he could get a job as a gas bar attendant in Niagara with his one good hand even though he had no way of returning to Canada to take this supposed job. Okay, so I've introduced a lot of issues and challenges here, um, but in this final section of the talk, what I really wanna do is talk about the positive, suggestions and examples of various efforts to improve migrant worker healthcare, and there've been plenty. So much of the research I've talked about has been summarized in the Migrant Worker Health Project, which I discussed at the beginning of the presentation. The aim of this has really been to provide information and inspiration to healthcare providers and other stakeholders to mobilize effective care solutions for migrant workers. Our website provides resources and information on migrant care for healthcare professionals and the general public, and we've made many presentations throughout the province similar to this. But many clinics over the past decade, including various community health centers and family health teams, have now included migrant workers as priority populations or provide a specific programming to them. And I'll just highlight a few of these efforts here. First, our partners, the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers have really been leaders in this regard. They've been providing mobile accessible health clinics throughout the province in a variety of settings and languages, setting up in places like community centers and soccer fields and really demonstrating to other clinics how this can be done. OCAO has also been involved in a number of related activities like health promotion, community engagement, and education. Two community health centers, Quest in Niagara and Grand River in Brantford, Ontario, have also been providing targeted primary care initiatives to workers in their communities. To make the clinics accessible, they had to think of outside of the typical box of healthcare provision. Hours are on evenings and weekends, translators are provided, and they found convenient locations to overcome the transportation barriers. 
In Niagara, Quest CHC operates in two sites out of a rented walk-in clinic and another in partnership with the church. Quest has also expanded its activities into the community, for example, offering health services, diabetes, and healthy eating education at community events and on farms. And many different students have assisted and faculty from the area, universities, and colleges. So it's been a really collaborative effort supporting thousands of clients. The Grand River CHC partnered with a grocery store in Simcoe to offer evening clinics actually inside the grocery store where the workers were often coming to buy their food anyway. They also offer clinics out of a converted vehicle. A dedicated community pharmacist works late to ensure workers can get their prescriptions immediately following their visit. Community and volunteer groups in both regions come together every year with support from these clinics to offer health information fairs and workshops. Hundreds attend these events where they receive information and resources such as free food and entertainment, and they really gain a sense of inclusion. Now, of course, some of these have been on hold due to COVID, but even then they've been offering virtual events. Various public health units have also been holding workshops and initiatives such as this one with Niagara Region Public Health focusing on women's reproductive and sexual health. Okay, so what can we learn from all of these initiatives? There are many, many things that providers can do to help facilitate accessible care. For example, providing services during the hours in which workers are likely to have time off and be in town, such as Friday nights or Sunday afternoons. Another option is to offer services in rural centers or on farms where workers are located. It's also important for providers to recognize and be able to offer assistance for common issues, such as musculoskeletal injuries. There may be bilingual resources. Many of them are on our website that can help um, to you know, provide suggestions for like safer postures and positions at work, for example. For sexual health, public health units may be able to offer free condoms, workshops, tests, and treatments. It's really important to find a translation option for the workers who do not speak English or French. Using employers or supervisors, obviously, as I've outlined, is very problematic. Um, so we really need to think elsewhere for finding resources. As well as conventional sources such as paid services or hospital translators, many communities have volunteers who are willing to provide services for free or for a small honorarium. There are also many resources on our website, like Spanish English dictionaries and bilingual guides that can be useful. Okay, so I wanna end my presentation by offering some brief reflections on how COVID has impacted the dynamic of migrant worker health. Many of the activities I've mentioned have been suspended or really greatly altered uh, due to the pandemic. But even more than that, COVID has impacted migrant workers at an alarming rate with thousands infected. Last year, three young workers lost their lives, including 31-year-old Bonifacio Eugenio Romero, 55-year-old Juan Lopez Chaparro, and Rogelio Munoz Santos at just 24 years old. Migrant workers are particularly vulnerable due to the lack of protections at work, as well as their overcrowded, poorly ventilated living environments, which do not allow for physical distancing. If you have dozens of workers sharing living quarters, including common bathrooms, bedrooms, and kitchen facilities, and one is infected, it can easily spread like wildfire, and that's exactly what happened. Now, here are some data that Michelle, too, put together. In 2020, about 12% of these workers tested positive for COVID-19. That's a very, very high rate. Looking at the 2021 pandemic data to date, it's looking worse than 2020, and not all workers have even arrived yet. The number of outbreaks on farms is four times as high as last year. COVID cases in agriculture early in the season are about the same as last year. It's important to note that all of these are cases in agriculture generally, so they include domestic workers as well as migrant workers, but the majority of these are likely migrant workers. Agricultural workers were identified as a priority population to receive COVID vaccines early, and vaccine clinics for temporary workers started at the end of March, including being uh, vaccinated at the airport upon arrival. Ontario's Deputy Chief Coroner conducted a review of the three deaths I mentioned in late 2020. The report was released in April of this year with 35 recommendations to prevent further illness and deaths, including recommending inquests and that deaths of migrants should be mandatory to report. And I strongly endorse those recommendations. There was general anticipation this year that with the vaccination program, there would be no more deaths from COVID. 
Despite this, five workers we know have already died this year in Ontario and seven in Canada. Unlike last year, the media did not pick up on these deaths, and there was little about this until there was a Globe and Mail article mentioning them. Really, very little is known about the specifics of these deaths. It's reported that five occurred while workers were in quarantine, so basically right after they arrived, before they even went to work in some of these cases. We know at least one worker died of COVID. The age range of these deaths is 23 to 57, with the average being just 42. Now, while the media has been quiet, workers are well aware of these deaths. They continue to be scared and to be restricted in quarantine sites or on farms. There has been a huge impact on their mental health as they don't know the reason for these deaths and they fear for their own safety. There's also been an influence on vaccine hesitancy as workers are wondering if they died following their airport vaccinations in quarantine. Further information about the context of these deaths is desperately needed. Here, I'm just highlighting a few of the key recommendations for healthcare from the Deputy Chief Coroner. These include having access to healthcare that is not dependent on employers, mobile health assessment teams, and campaigns to improve access to telehealth services. So same types of recommendations we've been making for years. And I really hope that some of these important recommendations will be finally realized. In response to the concerns around the pandemic this past year, my colleagues all involved on this project Susanna Kasha, Jenna Hanabri, and I co-founded the Migrant Worker Health Expert Working Group. Building on the Migrant Worker Health Project, we're a group of scholars and clinicians now from across Canada who've come together to raise awareness about the vulnerabilities of migrant workers and to make evidence-based recommendations to all levels of government to improve their health and safety. We've written numerous comprehensive sets of recommendations and met with various government stakeholders and public health units. These can be found on our website. Many public health units have responded with targeted campaigns to vaccinate and test migrant workers. In many ways, the pandemic has increased awareness about the plight of migrant workers, but it has also introduced new challenges. For example, workers are now even more isolated, with those at many firms not even being allowed to go into town anymore for their groceries and other needs. So much work remains to be done to ensure the health and protection of migrant workers. So I'll leave it there. Um, I guess to conclude, there have been many promising and innovative developments in migrant health care over the past decade, which I've highlighted here. But despite these efforts, most migrant workers still remain unable to access regular primary and other health care services. Mobile clinics have made a huge difference, but they have limitations. They may only be available one night a week or only in certain regions. So they're not a comprehensive solution. And they don't solve the problem of accessing other services, such as diagnostic tests and secondary care. Migrant workers are still getting sick and injured at alarming rates, and they are still dying. Much work remains to be done on structural policy reform, as well as local service provision, to improve these outcomes, as well as to improve workers' access to health care and workers' compensation. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I look forward to any questions.